<coughs> Amen. All right. Let's get our Bibles up now. We're going to do, as I said, been announced, announced last time that we're going to continue our study right on in the book of Philippians. So take your Bible, open to the book of Philippians. This is right after Ephesians. We just got through studying. And uh, we're going to look in there for a few minutes tonight and uh, study the Bible. We are commanded to study. If you got a King James Bible, that's the only one that's got a word in it. Uh, uh, it says study. Wonder why somebody would make a Bible and take out the word study. I wonder who would want that word study took out of there. I doubt it was the Holy Ghost. I know it wasn't the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost didn't tell them to take study out of the Bible. Uh, you're, not, you're supposed to read the Bible and you're supposed to study the Bible. Oh, by the way, I'm very, I'm very encouraged by the uh, reports we hear of people already finished their Bible. And here it is, just late October, and many are, uh, DJ asked me, he said, I'm done, Brother Danny, now what I do? And I said, what I do when I finish is I take on a study, like, like, like the rapture or evolution or, or some kind of doctrine or something, and then just dig into it for the next couple of months, And whereas you wouldn't spend that much time with it. So maybe that's a suggestion. Uh, if you start all over again, it's going to throw you off starting in, in January. If you want to do that, that's fine. But if you want to start all over again in January, study something else or read Psalms and Proverbs again. That's a good way to take up these extra days that we have left in the year. It is absolutely mind-boggling, hard to believe that we're talking end of the year. It, honest to goodness, I, I'm telling you, I, the, the older you get, I'm, boy, I'm telling you, a year goes by just like that. I, I remember thinking we have to wait and wait and wait for stuff to happen, but now it seems like I mean, it's just one thing right after another, another, and it, uh, it, no time. It's here. So uh, uh, I want to say again, thank y'all for being here at the camp meeting. I do believe that's probably the best attended camp meeting we've ever had. Consistent, big crowd. Friday night, you couldn't get a seat. And, and then uh, and Thursday night was big, and Saturday night was almost the same way. And, of course, Sunday morning was un unbelievable. And then Sunday night. A lot of times Sunday night, the service I, at the end, uh, you know, people lay out. But I'm telling you, Sunday night, there's a crowd in here, and we had a time. We had a time. So uh, I want to thank you again uh, for supporting the church and, and, and being hungry for God and, and the way you handle it, and I appreciate it. All right. Now, we're going to study here for the next few weeks the book of it, uh, Philippians, and this is just like Ephesians. You have those epistles. An epistle is a letter. And Paul wrote these letters to these churches, plural, that he started. And Philippi is where this came from. It was a, a place, a, 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 a location, a city, Philippi. And this is what we call one of the prison epistles, which means he's in jail when he wrote it. And that, that's very, very telling about what kind of man Paul was. He was and wrote this book of Philippians and I've been studying it and trying to get ready for tonight and you'd never know the man wrote that that was in jail I mean rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice and joy and happy and I, I thank God for you and I mean you, you'd think he's leaving in the holiday in but that shows right there that the apostle Paul did not judge his 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 gauge his happiness by his surroundings. And that also means you can be happier in jail than some people can drive in a limousine with a million dollars in the bank. You can. You can. Happiness ain't for sale. You don't, you don't say, well, if I just had a lot of money, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. You'd be just like everybody else. You can be happy with money. I mean, ain't nothing wrong with it, but it don't make you happy. You know what? The longer I've lived, and uh, it, the more I realize that you know what one of the greatest possessions you have outside your salvation? Is your health. I'm telling you, you health. Look, there's millions of people laying out there in beds. And they got money and can't, and can't even eat. Uh, I know God's blessed me with health and I might lose it tonight. I might choke on something eating tomorrow and choke to death. I might, have, I might do like my dad, just fall over with a heart attack. Now, I ain't stupid. That could happen any time. And but if God's give you help and you feel like working and going to church and singing 
and doing something for the Lord, boy, I'm telling you, you got something. There's millionaires all over Hollywood that give all their money to feel as good as you feel. So being rich ain't, ain't, ain't everything. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. I hope all of y'all get rich. But don't count on that to make you happy. You got to get your happiness from, from, from the Lord. The old song says, happiness is to know the Savior living a life. In, in His favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. And that's true. That's true. Happiness is the Lord. So Paul, the apostle, wrote this epistle while he was in jail, brother, and sent it uh, to these people here in Philippi. Uh, the book of Philippians has four chapters, 104 verses, 2,183 words. The key words in this little book are all and rejoice. Those are, they just keep coming up all through there. All and rejoice. Written about 61 or 2 AD. That means 30, uh, 40, 50, 60. Almost 30 years after Jesus went back to heaven. So 30 years after Jesus went back to heaven, Paul writes to the church in Philippi and he writes these words. Look at chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul. And Timotheus, that was his young son in the faith, the servants of Jesus Christ. Now look at that, boy. That's shouting ground right there. You know what? Paul didn't look at himself as a big shot. He didn't look at himself like, I'm the great apostle. You know, da, 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 da. He said, all I am is just a servant of Jesus Christ. My, my, my. We could learn some lessons from that. Uh, couldn't our generation of Christians learn from that? Uh, a, a, to, to all the saints... In Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Now, we've studied before about bishops and deacons. There's a difference. The, the word bishop, <coughs> excuse me, overseer and pastor are almost identical. That, that word uh, bishop the literal meaning of the word bishop is a guardian or an inspector. Um, an ordained elder in charge of feeding a flock and overseeing the work of God. That's the literal definition of a word bishop, where we would call pastor uh, uh, in, in our case. Now, uh, an overseer, an inspector. Have you ever worked at a factory? I guess all of us have worked in a factory at one time, and you got this inspector that comes through. He inspects your work. Well, that, that, that don't look good. You need, you need to redo this. Uh, that, good job there. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. No, no, that, that's unacceptable. You know, that's, that's what an inspector does. And you say, oh, we got to get this right. Inspector's coming through. So please don't get mad at me when I do that. Uh, that's my job. I try to make my rebukes mild instead of sharp. There is a time for a sharp rebuke. But the, an inspector does that. An ordained elder He's overseeing the work of God. You know who's going to give an account for all that goes on up here? I am. I am. I'm going to give an account to God for what happens here in this church and what we do, what we don't do, what we believe, what we don't believe, uh, what goes on behind this pulpit. What goes on. And you know, you've heard me say it a million times, uh, uh, anybody's welcome. The ground's level foot of the cross. Anybody, as long as they come peaceably, is welcome to come in here. But when you get up here serving in the work of the Lord, singing, preaching, and all that, that's a different story. Yeah, you got to be trying to live right. You got to be. You cannot be deliberately living in sin and carry out the overseeing ministry of the Lord. Now, I'm not, I know we all sin. I don't mean that. You know what I mean. You know exactly what I mean. What the, you mean? You know, something plain language. If a man comes in drunk and says, "I got a song on my heart," I'll say, "You have to wait a while, buddy." I won't be mean to him. I'll just say, you have to wait a while, buddy. Uh, uh, like that. Uh, nothing personal, but I, I'm in charge of this, uh, humanly speaking. Now, uh, said bishops and deacons, plural. Uh, I want to clarify something there a little bit. Uh, I'll talk about deacon in a minute. Uh, there's, there's, there's some people who take those words and, and say that a church is supposed to have a multiple group of leaders that are all equal. In other words, in other words, uh, like we'd have four or five bishops and four or five elders, and 
And when we're going to decide something, they all decide it. Now, what we always do here at our church, is we try to follow that line of thinking. Like, I don't just, I don't just get up here and say, all right, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And I, I mean, I know I can, and on little stuff I do that. But when it comes to something big and important, stuff like that, I talk to the men. We'll have a meeting. We'll call them. We'll bring before the church. Let everybody, if they want to say something about it, like that. And that way, everybody feels like a part. This is not a dictatorship. Uh, a church is not a, a dictatorship. I, I'm not supposed to be a dictator, uh, but I sure ain't going to let you be one. And uh, that's my job. And uh, they, most of the churches who complain about the preacher being a dictator are mad because they're not the dictator. And that's, why, that's what's ruined a lot of these little Baptist churches all over these mountains. I heard a man turn to me one time and he said, well, I don't think a preacher is supposed to run the church. I said, well, who's supposed to run it? Deacons? No, they're not. Nobody's supposed to run the church. He, he's, he's thinking wrong. The Bible teaches that we follow Christ and follow the leadership as they follow Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. And not ruling over with an iron rod and a fist uh, saying, I'll beat you in the head if you don't do what I tell you. No, it's not that way at all. But you are supposed to follow. You are supposed to follow the leadership of, of the pastor, bishop, overseer. Now, I don't believe that a church is supposed to have two pastors. And I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. If you'll read your Bible, especially in Romans, when Paul wrote to the church in, in Rome, there wasn't just one church. You remember he said, sometimes he'd say churches, and then sometimes he would say, he'd say so-and-so, so-and-so, and the church that is in their house. So, you know, I mean, you take a place like Rome, that was a big place. They probably had, I don't know how many churches. So he'd say elders and bishops and deacons. Uh, I don't, I, I, there's one president of the United States. There's, don't get me started, please. We need to pray for him. I pray for him every morning. I do. I'll not say what I pray, but I do pray for him every morning. I do. And uh, if when, when you have a company, there's always got to be a, a president, a, a, a leader. You can't, you say, well, we have multiple leaders in our church. And I, I know people that believe that, and they correct, try to correct me, and they say I'm wrong. But what do you do when they disagree with each other? What are you going to do when you're deadlocked? Three's for it and three's again it. Uh, somebody, just like in your home, uh, people say, well, I believe the husband and wife both have authority. Well, that's impossible. You know what the old preachers used to say? They used to say, anything with two heads is a monster. That's right. If you see something coming out of the woods and it's got two heads, it's a monster. And a church can't have two heads. A home can't have two heads. You'll be putting what you, uh, people say, well, uh, we pray about it. And he, he, the, the husband's not the boss in our house. We just pray about it and we both make this. What do you do when you disagree? I tell you what you do. You aggravate the fire out of him until he finally gives in. Most of the time. That's the way that thing works. I ain't stupid. I've been doing this longer than most of y'all been alive. I've seen it over and over and over. Times I've had people say, uh, Brother Danny, uh, uh, I've been trying to get Don here, my husband, to, to uh, get us a new car. So you help me pray about that? Yeah. John, I need a new car. I really, really need a new car. I need a car. No, you don't. No, you don't. We can't afford it right now. I need a new car. No, you don't. We can't afford it right now. And I mean, it's ever night. They fuss and they argue. And finally he says, okay, go get one. And she comes and said, John thinks we need a new car. She's in submitting to him. She ain't fooling nobody but herself. She ain't submitting. She's dictating to him. And if your job is to make sure your husband does everything you want him to do, you ain't in submission. You're a bossy old woman that needs to get right with God. And I'm not saying the wife don't have a say. I'm not saying that. A lot of times men be better off listening to their wife. Amen? Well, there have been times she, she, she corrects me a lot. No, she don't, she don't really. Uh, sometimes I scare her and I say that. She says, oh, it bothers me when you say And a lot of times she's right. God, if, if, if the Lord didn't want her to think he wouldn't give her a brain. Some women are just beat into subjection 
Or they just give up and they say, just whatever you say, I'll go along. Eat the raisin cane. That ain't right. That's no right. A woman and a man both supposed to have an opinion. I don't know how I got off on all this. Oh, yeah. About being by. But when you deadlock and you can't agree, somebody got to be the final authority. When you cannot agree and it's deadlock, then who has the final say? The husband. Who has the final say in the church? The pastor. I ain't saying that because I'm a pastor. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd believe that even stronger because I wouldn't want to answer God with it. But that's, that's what that thing means about that bishops, a bishop, an overseer. <clears throat> um, when, I was, when I worked over here at the plant uh, years and years ago, right before I got saved, I, I, we had overseer, buddy, and he'd walk through there like that. And I'd go, oh, here he comes. Like that. And that's a, we had a good respect and a sort of fear of that guy. Man, he'd fire us. And that's, that's why. And one of the preachers made mention of it uh, here the other day. If you heard him about respecting, I, I, I'm, I shrug back to say that because I am a preacher and I don't, y'all, you know me, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve no pastor appreciation day. I don't deserve no birthday dinner. I really, really don't. I'm not trying to sound humble and spiritual. I don't deserve it. I deserve being hell. So I'm not that way at all. Do I like, of course, but I don't deserve it. And I don't even, I don't think a preacher should expect it. But, but there should be a certain amount of respect. You should teach your kids to respect. Uh, just like you teach them to respect, you should teach them to respect their school teacher. You should respect them, a policeman. Don't ever let your kids be critical of policemen and call them names. And, and stuff. That's, that's crazy. One of these days you're going to need them. And you'll be glad they're there. And uh, 99 times out of 100, when your kid comes home and say, the teacher done me wrong, and blah, 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 blah. 99 times out of 100, if once you hear the, both sides of the story, that teacher was probably right. Nine, 99 times out of 100. Not every time. There are some bad teachers. There are some bad cops. There are some bad preachers. But most of the time, uh, you should treat them uh, with the respect they deserve. And, and he said bishops and deacons. Of course, we've been through that. The, the word deacon means a servant, a, a waiter, like a waiter at a restaurant. His job is to wait, wait, on the, the deacon serve. I got to thinking about that this week, like Brother Steve and Jeff. Uh, never miss unless they're sick or have to work. Jeff only mentions when he's sick or has to work. And he's he they waited on people all week. They just over and over. He's up here putting up lights. Jeff's hauling off trash, and other people did too. But that's the scriptural definition of a deacon. You know why the big churches downtown don't never get do nothing, can't never grow, and can't never have revival? Because there's five or six rich families in the church and they make the businessmen deacon to keep the money in the church and they try to run it like they run their business. And so anyway, if you and I've had people try to do me like that. And I have to tell them, this ain't a business, it's a ministry. Now we have to have some business. But the main thing of Shining Light Baptist Church is not like when we're going to build that building. Out of the, they'll, I'll get a lot of advice. People say, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this, you should do that, you should do that. And that's okay. I'm not against get, getting advice. But this, this brother, this, this is a ministry. This is a ministry. And if the Lord tells us to build a purple building, 30 foot tall, that big around right out there, then that's what we ought to do. If that don't make sense from a business point, that's so be it. And I'm not against being a smart businessman. What I am against is a bunch of big shots trying to run the church. Amen. And that'll, that'll never work. So deacons are servants. Good night. I'm still on the first verse. I'm sorry. Let's go. Number two. Verse two. Grace be unto you. Hallelujah. And peace, glory to God, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll take all we can get. Amen. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. There's a good sign of a good preacher right there. He said, every time I think about you, I thank God for you. That might not be a bad idea for us all. Every time you think about anybody in the church, pray for them. Thank God for your friendship. You got friends here in the church? Every day, thank God for them. I thank God upon every remembrance of you. Maybe old Paul was sitting over in jail. He's sitting there with his hand, handcuffs or feet, whatever they had him. And he's sitting there thinking about them people over in Philippi. And he's like, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. I'm in here and I'm locked up. I thank God they're still over there shouting, having church. He said, I think that's a real preacher. 
in my opinion, I feel sorry for people that have to go to a church where the preacher hates everybody. I've been in preacher's meetings where just a bunch of preachers preached and one got up and said, wow, that bunch of devils, I have to pastor. I, uh, and I thought, man, I ain't no way to talk about your church. I ain't no way to talk about your church. Listen, y'all, I don't talk bad about this church and I don't let nobody else talk bad about this church. Amen. Amen. I ain't been a smart, but listen, when somebody says, I'm saying, now, wait a minute now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Our church ain't perfect, but thank God we got a good church. Amen. Amen. I, I believe we ought to believe our church is the best church around. And everybody else should believe that about their church. We're not perfect. We're a long way from it. But I'm telling you, uh, old Paul said, I thank God on every mention you. He didn't say, oh, Lord, that bunch of devils over in Philippi. I dread it when I have to see them. He said, I thank God on every remembrance of y'all. And I'm telling you, if a pastor loves his people, let me tell you about it. I've been, as y'all see back there, 46 years of pastoring. There's no way you can describe it, how this feels. I wish everybody could feel it for a while. It's full of ups and downs. We get, we get really get to rejoice about something and it's heartbroken over other things. And if a preacher loves his church, and by the way, a man can preach real hard on sin. He can preach hard on sin if he does it with a heart of love. It's true. It's true. Uh, and sometimes you, sometimes pastor in a church, you, just, you ask her, I try not to get her in. I don't, I don't want to drag her in on all. The, I don't tell her, uh, you know, a lot of people say, you should not keep nothing from your wife. Or, you ain't never pastor of church. Was there some stuff I couldn't tell her? She wouldn't have no confidence in none of you. Uh, but uh, and and I keep that from her, and I just me and the Lord, <laughs> me and the Lord know it, and whoever's involved. But uh, uh, you you got to carry that burden alone. Now thank God the wife helps, and a pastor's wife should help him. But the bit she has no idea some of the stuff that goes on here, some of the phone calls that I get, some of the mess I have to deal with, the way people talk to me sometimes. She has no idea. I don't tell her because I think if I do, she's she going to have hard feelings toward that person. And I know a lot of preachers who their wife can't stand half the church members because he goes home and dumps all the ever bit of trash in the church on his wife. And she shouldn't have to bear that. Amen. She shouldn't. He's, he's got strong shoulders. He's one God called to be the pastor, not her. Amen? Amen. It, it, uh, 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 a lot of times people expect the pastor's wife to bear the same burden. She ain't the pastor. God, God didn't call her to be a pastor. She just got stuck with this. Amen. Uh, she's, she's in a rough spot. I, I can at least get up here and blast you. She has to just sit there and take it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, if, if you're in your heart, if, if a pastor has his people in their heart, uh, you love them like your kids or your family. Everybody in this church is like, a, like family. I got y'all memorized. I know where everybody sits. And on my way home, I say, so no one so no one so no one so no Ask, ask Carol, I say, can you text so and so? I mean, I mean, I'm talking about people that just come occasionally. All y'all that come regularly, I know when you're here, when you're not here. And I like, like, there's two families. One sits right back there, and another sits right back there that have missed a little bit lately. And they here. I said, where y'all been? And they said, uh, some travel ball or something like that. And they said. We're next weekend's the last weekend, brother Danny. Don't you worry. This is going to stop. I said, good, good. Uh, get in here all you can. And they, and you know, it, it's like that. It's, it's like you, it's like you, if a, if a, if a preacher is a real preacher, he don't just preach because to try to show his knowledge of the Bible or fuss at people or just try to make an impression and sound like a great I mean, and it sure the Lord ain't for money I mean you don't do this for money I, I, if I want to make money there's a lot more ways I can figure out to make money than, than doing this and I ain't complaining but I'm telling you a preacher that's got you know, his church in his heart it's, it's, you can get your heart broke a lot but your blessings are well worth it now I'm like, I'm like the song we sang I've had more gains than losses I get my heart broke but thank God the blessings have far outweighed the burdens. They really have. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, I thank God upon every room. Every time I think about y'all, 
I thank God. When I'm down there uh, Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, preaching in Florida, I wonder what's going on here. And I'll try to get on my, on my phone there and try to see if, see what's going on if I can and, and see, uh, get some texts. Carrie always texts me. She'll text me right at the end of Sunday school. Went good, Daddy. Kelly will text me. Right there. We had a big crowd day. Had so many on the bus. And that's more that sounds good, I think. Thank God nothing crazy happened. You know, some some nut ain't come in and try to take over or something uh, like Bean Woman did that time. Uh, we tried to get her to come to church for a year, and she came the Sunday I wasn't here. How many of y'all was here that day? Raise your hand. Remember that? Oh, my goodness. It was awful. Uh, they had to escort her out. John did, didn't you, John? Uh, didn't didn't you and Bean Woman finally break up? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was kidding about her. But... Uh, uh, it, I always wonder, oh, Lord, please don't let some idiot come in there and start screaming jihad or something. Uh, uh, Lord, Lord, help. But uh, he said, I have you in my heart. I got you in my heart. Look at verse 4. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. He said, it's not a burden. It ain't killing me. I'm not walking around saying, poor old me, I'm trying to be the pastor. He's locked up and saying, glory to God, I'm shouting when I think about y'all. Amen? Amen? Request with joy for your fellowship. That's another thing. I don't like to hear a preacher get up and mealy mouth around all the time about how hard he's having it and how bad things are. I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think he should be fake, but I, I like to hear somebody get up and say, bless God, this is the day the Lord's made, and we ought to enjoy it and shout and praise God, don't you? I mean, don't that lift your spirits when the first... First man that runs up here and say, good to be saved, ain't it, y'all? Let's, let's go to church. Let's have a good time. Not fake. Not fake. They've learned how to fake it, and people fall for it like, like honey driven out their mouth. But he said, for your fellowship of the gospel from the first day until now. All right, verse 6, we'll get into just a little bit of doctrine, and we'll never get, I made notes all the way up to verse 12, 11, 11 tonight, but we'll never get to them. Uh, verse 12, verse 6, we're not going to get into as much doctrine as we did in Ephesians. There's a lot of heavy doctrine. There's not that much more devotional stuff in Philippians. But look at verse 6, 5, 6. Being confident this very thing, that has begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now that, that right there is one of the strongest verses in the epistles for the belief in eternal security. As we get made fun of, called names, heretics, as people are now, they'll say, Brother Danny, surely, you know, these hundreds and hundreds of people cut me off because I have so many beliefs and convictions and doctrine, and you cross them one time, and I ain't listening to them no more. And that's to their, that's to their detriment. I mean, I hate it for them because they're cutting themselves off all the good stuff they could be getting. But the doctrine of eternal security I mean, look at that verse. It said, he that begun a good work in you, he's going to keep doing it. He's going to perform that until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, he either meant, he either meant, he that began a good work in that church of Philippi, work in that church, some will fall out, some will get in, some will fall out, some get in, or he meant to the individual uh, in, in you, We'll perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. I, and I personally believe that's what he meant. Um, you, could, you, could, you could make the case. Well, he's just talking to the church in general and some of them will fall out. You could make that case. But honestly, I, I think that's one of the strongest verses in the New Testament for the fact that God started something in you when you got saved and he's going to keep working on you until he one day perfects you and presents you blameless up there before God. You know the little song, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. It really ought to be a sign upon my heart. Don't judge me yet. There's an unfinished part. You know, that's a kid's song, but that's, a full, that's full of doctrine. That's full of it. That's, that's more than uh, Hallelujah. That's got more doctrine than hallelujah I ever thought about. Uh, I remember when the Lord saved me, he started working on me immediately. And here it is. You've heard this illustration a hundred times. There's a man one day, and there's a great big old rock. Big, huge rock. Big as that hole right there. 
and he's up on a he's up on a ladder and had a hammer and a chisel and he's ding 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 ding. And the guy looked up and said, "What is that?" He said, "It's an elephant." That guy said, "It don't look like no elephant to me." And he said, "Well, that's what it is." He said, "How are you gonna make that look like an elephant?" And he said, "All you got to do is knock off everything that don't look like an elephant." And when you're done, you got an elephant, right? That's exactly what I'm talking about tonight. You couldn't illustrate that no better. When you get saved, you got a lot of junk on you that don't look like Jesus. And the Bible said the Holy Spirit is going to to conform you to His image. That's why as soon as you get saved, you'll go somewhere you went and say, I don't feel right going here no more. He's just knocking off everything that don't look like Jesus. You'll watch something on TV and say, this don't feel right, this don't feel right. Uh, You'll listen to a song. You used to really love it. And you're trying to love it again. And your flesh is like, but inside something saying, this ain't good for you. This ain't good for you. And if you'll let him, he'll knock off stuff that don't look like Jesus. We're all a work in progress. Amen? We really are. We still got a lot of junk on us and in us and around us and through us. And the Lord, the Holy Ghost takes that chisel. If you'll pray and read your Bible and go to church, the, the Holy Ghost will chisel off of you everything that don't look like Jesus. Now, as far as eternal security, uh, you got that from, from the beginning of the church to the rapture. You are a part of his body. During the tribulation, that might be a different story. Matthew 24 said they had to endure to the end to be saved. Uh, the Old Testament saints that were not in the body of Christ. That's why they didn't go to heaven when they died. They went to Abraham's bosom. When the blood was shed, it got them out and took them up there. They'll be guests. A lot of people during the tribulation at the wedding. But he that hath the bridegroom uh, is the bride, is the, is the, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. And we're a part of the body of Christ. And in this age, if you are a part of his body and he's a part of you, that, that's, that's what they call once saved, always saved. And people hate that. They, you can say it without saying that, and they can swallow it. But if you say that, boy, they'll cut you off. They probably a bunch of people cut me off just now. But they don't understand that we are a part of his body, y'all. You can't break relationship. You can break fellowship. Right. My girls, tonight, they broke fellowship. Sometimes we're not in good fellowship. But no matter what they do, they're still my girls. And your kids are your kids no matter what they do. They're yours by birth. You're by birth. They're born into your family. My daughters, were born, they're castles. They ain't nothing can be done about that. They ain't nothing can be done about it. It's fixed. They might be a good one or a bad one, but they're a castle. It's a blood. My blood is in them. And when you're born into God's family, His blood covers you, and you are a part of His family. Now, that's shouting ground. Now, that is not an excuse to get us to live like a devil. I mean, yeah, that's the first thing you hear people say, oh, yeah, I believe that. I just go live like a devil. Well, I believe it, and I ain't out living like a devil. That makes me want to do my very best to please the Lord because of how good he's been to an old dog like me. But so I, I, I'm about out of time, but take that verse to the bank. And how many of y'all know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about him working on you? Raise your hand, please. All right, I, I believe that's everybody in here. Right, you you know what he's talking about. He's working on you. He's still working on me. And sometimes, sometimes uh, you'll see bumper stickers and stuff and say, "Be patient with me. God's not through with me yet." That's the truth. That's the truth. That is so true. I mean, that is so true. Amen. Be patient with your husband. God ain't through with him yet. Be patient with your wife. God ain't through with him yet. Be patient with your kids. God ain't through with them yet. One day he'll perfect us. We'll get rid of this sinful body. Get a brand new body, and he'll put us up there on the shelf. Uh, as perfect in Christ. Okay? All right. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this little time of study tonight. Thank you for the riches and the meat in this scripture here tonight. Lord, it's, it's hard to imagine and believe how how much stuff is just in these few little verses. And I, Lord, we never, it's never amazed me how much, how much you can go with this one or two verses of scripture. And Lord, help us to uh, spend more time in your word and and just eating it up like we have tonight and and less time on the phone and more time in your word. God, please, God, give us a hunger and a desire for it. Lord, I pray that you bless all the people watching from home and online and those that will hear. 
and, and take part of this service tonight. Bless all of them. Lord, bless our church. Please, Lord, keep your hand on this place. God, give me a safe trip down yonder and bless the services. Moving mighty power. I pray for Brother Rowan that you bless him. Having to be back at the church soon. God bless everything you said or done here. We'll thank you and praise you for it. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you. Liberty to go. Fellowship a little bit. Don't rush off.